1974, Steven Spielberg introduced us to a film called The Sugarland Express. It stars Goldie Hawn, Ben Johnson, William Atherton, and Michael Sachs. It's based on a real-life incident that occurred in Texas when a husband and wife team tries to outrun the law. In doing so, they take a police officer hostage and they flee across Texas trying to get to see their child before he's placed in foster care. Some of the actual events took place in the areas where this movie was filmed, those being Sugarland, Texas, and other filming locations around the state like San Antonio, Live Oak, Pleasanton, Converse, and Del Rio, Texas. John Williams scores the movie and this is the first collaboration between him and Spielberg. He goes on to do almost every movie that Spielberg has directed, and it also puts Spielberg in a different genre that he's normally not in, which is the crime genre. Also bringing along with him to this anomaly, he has the comedic actress of Goldie Hawn who does just an amazing job in the film. She's definitely the one that's in control in this movie. She calls the shots on the screen and makes it known that she's the one that wears the pants in the family. When I watch the movie, I find myself just constantly giggling through the very first half of the film. There's some funny stuff in here, not just from the main actors, but from some of the secondary people that are supporting the main cast. One that comes to mind immediately is the old couple that they convince to take them away from the prison. The interaction between these two old married people is just hilarious. The true story of this crime takes place in May of 1969 with the kidnapping of a Department of Public Safety trooper named Kenneth Crone. The real fugitives were Robert and Isla Faye Dent. They ended up taking Crone and his patrol car, and they led law enforcement officials on a more or less O.J. Simpson-style chase from outside Port Arthur, Texas, through Houston, up to the small town of Wheel Lock, north of Bryan, Texas. This caravan of vehicles that tagged along eventually grew to more than 150. Television crews in helicopters tagged along as well. Bystanders lined the roads just to try to catch a glimpse of this spectacle. In the end, the couple made their way to Isla May's mother's house. This is where they were met with a contingent of officers, including FBI Special Agent Bob Wyatt. As Robert held Crone still at gunpoint, Wyatt and Robertson County Sheriff Johnny Elliott shot and mortally wounded him. They then captured Isla May. The names were different in the Spielberg movie and his version of it, and quite a few liberties were taken just to dramatize the events in a better screen form. But the gist of the film is pretty true. It did really happen. Isla May got sentenced to five years in prison, but she got out after five months to take care of her mother and children. She eventually ended up dying in 1992 in Livingston, Texas, where she was working at a Holiday Inn in the dietary department. Most of the law enforcement officials have passed on, including Kenneth Crone, who was the one that was kidnapped. He died back in 2011 but he had left the Texas DPS many years before and was working privately in security in various forms. One major challenge that Steven Spielberg was faced with was bringing together the acting styles of Goldie Hawn and William Atherton. Atherton, who was a stage-trained actor, got better with each successive take, but Goldie Hawn did her best work on the first or second take. She did, however, get a second wind if the scene went into multiple takes, like 12 takes or more. Spielberg found it best to start with her in close-ups. Then he would film Atherton's close-ups until Goldie started to rebound, at which he would get the two shots that he needed when they were both at their best. A good portion of this film is shot inside a car thus creating a different kind of problem than you normally deal with. Panavision chose this movie for the launch of Panaflex, 
which was a compact camera that enabled the director to shoot really complex shots inside the patrol car. It gave them the ability to feature tracking shots from front seat to back and a 360 degree pan from with inside the car. He also shot the film in continuity. That made it a lot easier to control the production cost as the size of the entourage that followed the main characters grew steadily through the course of the film. It also helped the actors develop their characters more fully, thinking that Spielberg needed a chance to get his feet wet before they started shooting the complex shots. Richard Zanuck instructed the production manager to start the film with relatively simple shots. He also decided to get to the location late that morning so that Spielberg could establish control of the set. But when he arrived, he discovered that the director had set up one of the film's most complicated shots to be pulled off the very first thing, and he did the entire thing without a hitch. Spielberg was meant to be sitting in that director's chair. They were unable to find a child that looked like they would be the offspring of Goldie Hawn and William Atherton. So what did they do? Co-producer Zanuck cast his own son, Harrison Zanuck. He's the little kid. During the whole shooting schedule, Spielberg and the cinematographer had breakfast almost every morning to discuss that day's shoot and the work that was scheduled. They agreed to give the film more of a documentary-type feel, and they would watch a lot of documentaries at night, just trying to find the one that would solve problems that they had on the set. The cinematographer really practiced using almost all natural light. That helped a great deal in the direction of this film. Now, although the events that occur in the film are over a couple of days, in reality, the events were over pretty quickly in just a few short hours. And the hijacked Texas Department of Public Safety patrol car that's featured in the film, which is a 1973 Dodge Polara, ended up meaning so much to Steven Spielberg that he bought it after the filming, bullet holes and all. When the caravan is driving through the large crowd in Rodrigo, a bystander hands Lou Jean a piglet as a gift. She immediately declares, he's peeing on me. She said this several times. When Steven Spielberg tells this story, he says that the little piglet did end up peeing on Goldie Hawn during the scene. Now, if you look at the time when the criminals have stopped at the chicken restaurant to eat, where Ben Johnson's character has brought in two snipers to possibly pick them off as they sit in the car. As you watch both of these snipers get ready to try to put their scopes on the individuals, each one of them initially sticks a bullet in their mouth and licks it with their tongue and then immediately sticks it in their right ear. There's been a lot of questions on why this was done and whether it actually was something that affected their ability to shoot a long-range shot. The truth is, during that time, that was a way that when in the field, they were able to give themselves instant ear protection. Back then, wearing earmuffs was not a common thing at all. It never happened while they were working. The practice of taking an unspent cartridge out of their belt and using it as ear protection was a fairly common thing. The next time you watch the movie, look for that scene. It really stands out to you. It kind of hits you in the face when you see them do it. And your initial thought is, what are they doing? It seems so odd. Sugarland Express has my vote as being a fun movie to watch and is definitely a picture of what this director was capable of. As later on in his career, we find out he's probably one of the best in the business. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.